So <clears throat> who wants to kind of take a crack at this one? Um, I can start off at one. low power. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so this looks like a shave biopsy. And I think um, it's a neoplastic process. Good. I'm kind of looking in at the epidermis mostly. Um, and then, you guys have had a chance to review these slides too, right? Yes, we did have a chance to look over them. Excellent, good. So, um, and I think we were leaning towards malignant, just kind of with bigger cells um, spreading the whole epidermis. Yeah, yeah, good. So it's 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 very broad, isn't it? And for it's the entire epi yes. epidermis is involved. So it's an intraepidermal neoplastic process good and it's not just focal as you noted it's it's diffuse right. it goes throughout the entire epidermis so that's again one of the, the signs of malignancy is is poor circumscription and breadth so an asymmetry so this kind of has all three of those uh, that you can <laughs> yes. de determine so that's good um and then in terms of the cellular differentiation i think epithelial cells in the epidermis so Okay, good. Um, That's kind of important here <clears throat> in this uh, case. Why why is it important in this well, specific case? I mean, is there is there non-epithelial that can involve the epidermis in this pattern? So this looks like pagetoid spread. So I guess the differential includes Paget's disease or extra mammary Paget's disease, um, squamous cell carcinoma in situ, or it could be like um, a superficial spreading melanoma in situ, or I think even a metastatic alternate tumor that's metastatic to the skin, like colon. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. Well, like the exactly. So, like in, in other words, uh, extra mammary pagets or pagets or breast mammary pagets, both of those can look the same. The extra mammary pagets can sometimes be like a contiguous spread of underlying GI or GU malignancy, especially if it occurs in the groin area. So yeah, that's that's exactly right. Um, and you said that this was pagetoid spread. You're right about that, which basically means, when we talk about that, it means like you look at Paget's disease itself. And then the pattern of that is where you get these single cells that spread throughout the epidermis say, well, hey, there are other conditions that look like that, but they're not that. So that's why we actually call it pagetoid. Right. And th what about the cells themselves? Are those pagetoid? Yeah, they have that um, ample kind of purplish cytoplasm. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> so this would be like pagetoid spread, pagetoid cells and pagetoid pattern. And those <laughs> entities that you just mentioned are exactly the ones that you were thinking about. Now, are there any other non-epithelial intraepidermal pagetoid proliferative neoplastic conditions that can simulate this sometimes, besides those that you mentioned that are non-epithelial? Um, there's, there's two. There's two. Okay, so I think we had mentioned the melanoma and then in the chat, someone saying sebaceous carcinoma also. Oh, you guys have a chat up? Uh, let me, uh, I can look at that probably. Let me just see here. Well, I, I, if I do, it takes up so much of the screen. I can't really see it. We're going to, I'm going to probably get a second monitor. <laughs> we think that might be a way where I can kind of look at the chat and everything on the side. So, but unfortunately, I, I, if I look at the chat, I won't be able to, to go through the slide with you. So yeah, sebaceous carcinoma, but that's epithelial, right? And there's, there's what else is epithelial that can involve the epidermis like this? You've mentioned the major ones, but now these are the, uh, for those of you who want to make the higher grade on the board, um, you need to know these other few that can do that. So sebaceous carcinoma is one. Um, I'll, I'll read the chat. Someone says MF. Good. That's the one I was looking for, the old... Um, you know, read my mind. So mycosis fungoides and what specific variant of mycosis fungoides? Hmm. It's got a name. 
And the old name for it is reticulosis. Yeah, pagetoid reticulosis. Reticulosis is the old 18th century term for lymphoma, basically. They, they didn't understand what they were looking at, but so they called it pagetoid because it involved the epidermis, kind of like this. Uh, reticulosis because it was a lymphoma. And so it's, it's basically gives you marked intraepidermal involvement with the neoplastic lymphocytes with l relatively less involvement of the dermis. It's sort of almost like a vacuum cleaner, just sucks them up into the, into the epidermis. And there's two subtypes of so-called pagetoid reticulosis. Anybody know what that is? Yeah, you can read the chat if you want. If somebody wants to chime that in. Some of these third years should be old hat to them, at least somewhat of an old uh, hat. Oranger Collop. Oranger Collop is one. And Ketron Goodman. Ketron Goodman. Excellent. The Ketron Goodman type is widespread multiple lesions, often CD8 positive. They're, they're both actually CD8 positive a lot of the time, most of the time. Mm -hmm. And that one can have a bad prognosis. The Warren J. Collop is often a localized lesion on volar skin. It almost looks like dishydrotic dermatitis or chronic hand dermatitis. So you have to keep that in the differential diagnosis. You take a biopsy of that to make sure that you're not dealing with one of those conditions when you've got a chronic hand dermatitis. So those are both lymphomas that can simulate this. And there's another lymphoid, hematolymphoid lesion that can give you this pattern as well. Besides MF slash uh, pagetoid reticulosis variant. Nobody knows that one? Nothing in the chat about that one yet. Langerhans cell histiocytosis also gives you, it gives you epidermotropism of Langerhans cells. So that one can look even more like this uh, in some cases than the, the Warren J. Kala patchy reticulosis. And then there's one final intraepidermal uh, neoplasm that can give you this pattern. Besides sebaceous carcinoma and the others we've mentioned that is, is you do need to know that one. I don't think anybody's Why mentioned. Someone said epidermotropic CD8 T cell. Well, that would kind of be MF, pagetoid reticulosis. That's mm -hmm. sort of in the same category. But there's one other epithelial neoplasm that can give you a pagetoid epidermal involvement as well. Nobody knows? Merkel cell, neuroendocrine carcinoma, can also give you an intraepidermal uh, involvement with the Merkel cell. So that's basically... So that differential is, is, that's the key to this case, is, is that. There are a couple other things here. Um, if you look at this, this is the so-called eyeliner sign, mm -hmm. um, where you've got a, a, a residual basal cell, normal basal cell with the atypical pagetoid cells right above it. That's very helpful for helping distinguish between pagetoid uh, squamous cell carcinoma in situ, which involves the basal cell layer and Paget's disease, either breast or extra mammary, which generally tends to spare that. So that would favor that. The other thing that will help you is if you can see areas of ductal differentiation, sometimes you'll see that. Um, if you look in the cells and you see mucin, that can help you. And then if you look for um, you may have immunoperoxidase stains. You know, now, most of you guys, at least you third years know that um, I like to do uh, this to me is the best stain is the H and E stain, but in some of these cases, you do actually need to use immunoperoxidase staining if it's not, if you don't see these classic findings. And so CK7 is the classic marker that's positive for Paget's disease. Um, and then of course you could do uh, SOX10 or S100 protein for melanoma, squamous, uh, cytokeratin if it's Bowen's disease, uh, look for like INSM1 or one of the neuroendocrine markers if you're worried about Merkel, adipophilin for sebaceous carcinoma. So just make sure you know those various markers associated with that. So this is a, a really good um, example. And, and this is just right down the middle of the fairway for what you might get for a board type question on this. So th this is very fair game for uh, a board exam. Okay. Another case here, totally different pattern. What kind of biopsy do we have here? Like an incision, deep fine. Good, probably like an incision or maybe even an enucleation biopsy. When we see kind of a dermal 
nodule or dermal nodular aggregation of uh, inflammatory cells or whatever, even neoplastic cells with no derm no epidermis, nothing like that. Clinically, the dermatologist may have said, well, that feels like a cyst. I'm going to just kind of do a little uh, incision on the top of it. I'm going to just kind of pop it out and enucleate it out. Like if you have to, unfortunately, enucleate somebody's eye. Well, same kind of thing here. So they probably, this is probably some kind of a nodular infiltrate in the dermis. So that's, that's a, a good, important bit of information, preliminary information. So do you think this is an inflammatory or a neoplastic process? Um, from mm -hmm. low power, I thought this was inflammatory. Good, good. It was inflammatory. And, and for you first years, there's nine basic patterns of inflammatory skin disease that we talk about. I'm not going to ask you to name all of those today, but after our intro talk in July, you'll, you'll be an expert on those. So, uh, which of the patterns do you think this fits into best? Um, so I thought this was, I mean, we don't have much of the um, epidermis and dermis to say if it's diffuse, but based on what we have, I thought this was the paniculized type. Yeah, it, it's probably, yeah, it looks like it's involved in the fat and, and maybe some of the dermis, if there is much dermis present. And yeah, it looks like it's kind of a diffuse involvement here. And if it's, if it is a paniculitis, I think we have another paniculitis slide coming up in a minute. Uh, there's two main patterns of paniculitis too, right? Which would, would you call this one? I would call this lobular. Yeah, diffuse lobular involvement of the paniculus, exactly. And there's probably some, you know, inflammation in the dermis as well. So good. And then what uh, type of inflammatory cells were you looking at here? Um, I mean, even from low power, I started to see multinucleated giant cells and histiocytic change, some of those paler cells, um, and then some like nodular collections of lymphocytes as well. Good. Excellent. Super. So lobular paniculitis with granulomatous. Anytime you get histiocytes predominating, it's granulomatous, at least in part. And uh, were you able to determine anything else when you got to higher magnification? Um, there's no like characteristic like needle cell, needle shaped clefts within the endocytes, um, which we rule against um, subcutaneous fat necrosis or post steroid paniculitis. In this okay, case. good. Yeah, so if, when you're looking at the lobular paniculitides, you ask yourself, well, what, what kind of inflammation is involved in the lobules? And is it, is it neutrophils mostly? Is it a mixed infiltrate with maybe some eosinophils? Is it histiocytes mostly like we see here with these little nodular pseudolymphominous aggregates of lymphocytes? Um, and then, yeah, you, you would look to see if it's one of the crystalline-based uh, paniculitides, which you're right, there's none of that. Uh, anything else? Um, it seems relatively... I guess diffuse the granulomatous pattern, um, or at the very least, patchy. Um, and then there does not seem to be vasculitis based on the low power. Good. So if you had vasculitis with lobular paniculitis, what do you think about in that situation? Um, we'd have to determine if it's small or large vessel. And if it's smart, small vessel, I think that favors either like um like a Lucio's or erythema nodosum leprosum. And yeah, then... or, or nodular vasculitis, which those things are all kind of in the same category. We used to think nodular vasculitis was purely associated with, um, with tuberculosis. Basically, that whole pattern can be seen in, in a lot of things. Uh, and any of the infectious diseases that give you paniculitis associated with it can give you that nodular vasculitis-like pattern. So that, and that usually gives you more of a separative inflammatory reaction with the vasculitis, as opposed to just this granulomatous inflammation with these lobular aggregations of these lymphocytes and some plasma cells. What about all these holes here? Um, I mean, they definitely didn't look like adipocytes. Um, they made me think of some kind of foreign body material. Good. Excellent. Good. So yes. So this doesn't look like a classic histologic pattern of one of the more characteristic paniculitides. It's obviously not periseptal with granulomas inflammation like you might see with erythema nodosum. It's not LE profundus, obviously, that doesn't give you granulomatous inflammation. Um, it's not really a separative granulomatous inflammatory reaction, and it doesn't have the needle-shaped clefts like you talked about previously. So it might make you think of, of what other process it's giving you these little round bubbles and holes, if you will. Um, foreign body granulomas. Yeah. Good, foreign body. And any specific type of foreign body? 
I guess the first one that comes to mind is like a like a paraphenoma um, can have that Swiss cheese pattern. Yeah, good, good paraphenoma and and uh, or there's and notice here you've actually got a little droplet inside that histidine site right there. So that's a pretty good clue to that. Um, what's what's another thing that looks pretty close to paraphenoma? It's a similar kind of thing that people get injected also. Oh, silicone. Silicone. Yeah, this was actually silicone. Granuloma. And when it actually induces this kind of granulomatous reaction, it's probably not industrial grade silicone that was injected for wrinkles. It's probably more like the people that go to, uh, you know, Mexico or places like that. They want to get their uh, buttocks uh, enhanced and they inject these large amounts of silicone in there and uh, very dangerous situation because, as you know, that stuff can migrate throughout the body. Uh, people can get uh, pulmonary emboli and uh, thrombosis and all sorts of negative consequences from that. Uh, and so that's basically what this is. I, I don't think you need to really distinguish between silicone and paraphenoma. Uh, the textbooks talk about that, but they're basically the same deal. And, uh, you know, if you get a really industrial grade silicone granuloma from someone that's really just got a reaction to maybe nanogram like quantities of, of uh, possibly foreign material in there, they're going to just get these little fine uh, small granulomas that are associated just with the droplets of silicone. Somebody gets a giant thing like this. It basically is got some foreign material in there also. So there's really not a lot of distinction between paraphenoma and, and, and silicone injection. Now, just one final thing. What's the, uh, what's the difference between silica and silicone? Um, I think one of them is the elemental form and the other is not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that's, yeah, that's exactly right. Silica, silicate is basically uh, glass. And so when you get like in an automobile accident and you get shards of glass in your skin, you can get develop sarcoidal granulomatous dermatitides with polarizable foreign material because that stuff is, an, is a crystal and it polarizes as opposed to silicone, which is SI uh, in the you know, periodic table. And theoretically, that should be, uh, it should be non-inflammatory, really. It's supposed to, it, that's why these guys use it for um, injecting into wrinkles. It induces just a, a very mild reaction, more fibrotic reaction. Um, and so you shouldn't really get that kind of reaction. And that is non-polarizable. So, and, and that usually gives a little teensy tiny droplets like we see here. So it's tiny bubbles, if you will, uh, is silicone uh, crystals or what you get when you get silica. So they're the two different kind of things, even though they both have the silicon um, in there. Okay, well, let's give this one a go. Get this straight here. I've never made it as a neurosurgeon, I don't think. <laughs> They're hard to maneuver. Um, so this looks like a punch. Um, on low power, it looks like there is some like superficial perivascular inflammation. Um, would you call that like, diff would you put that in the superficial perivascular category or more diffuse? Yeah, it's it's kind of uh, becoming nodular and diffuse a little bit. That's not dense diffuse over most of the dermis, but yeah, it's involving the uh, upper reticular dermis and the mid reticular dermis, but it's, it is localized in this one area, but it's kind of almost like nodular, okay. uh, I would say. So yeah, that's that's not unreasonable. Yeah, so we're going nodular, then we look at the cell type. Um, and so when I looked at this earlier, I thought the predominant cell type, there were a lot of histiocytes present as well as lymphocytes. Good. So yeah, and you could tell that even if we were showing it to you right now for the first time too, right? Yes, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> So, and we, and the gentleman before just mentioned this. So if you look at low magnification and the cells look pale, mm -hmm. um, think histiocytes. Right. And then if they're predominant, so when histiocytes predominate in an area, then think granulomatous inflammation, right? Right. Okay. And so in the types of granulomas, like to me, this doesn't look like it's like palisading. It doesn't look like separative. Like it doesn't look like the last one where there's like, um, you know, something else involved in there. Like this almost looks like, and I know this isn't one of the categories, but this looks like one of the like linear granulomas, I guess. Um, well, if you think about uh, 
So it's certainly not separate granulomas. We rule that out. There's no neutrophils in it. Um, it doesn't have sarcoidal tuberculoid granulomas. Right. So that's out. Right. Um, it doesn't have tuberculoid uh, central caseation degeneration. So it's not tuberculoid granulomas, even though we, you know, we talk about uh, epithelioid granulomas. As sar we talk about tuberculoid Hansen's as sarcoidal histologic change. So it's, it's not that. Um, it doesn't have any foreign material in there. So it's not a foreign body granuloma. So it, it actually is palisaded, but it's when you get like a lot of inflammation and it becomes sort of, you know, inter you see that these cells are arranged between and among collagen bundles and they, they're sort of trying to form a palisade. If you get a really nice ring, like GA, you can say, ah, that's palisaded. Or you get a nice ring, like you see in a rheumatoid nodule, that's palisaded. When you get sort of, uh, the cells are more interstitial between and among collagen metals over a diffuse area like this, it's a variant of palisaded granuloma. So this, it doesn't look, it's, it's got, it's so inflamed, it looks a little bit, um, it doesn't look like the classic palisaded granuloma. And then, so this, this isn't classic GA, for example, here, right? It, it's not perfect for GA, but it's, it's closer to that than it probably is any of the other types of granulomatous inflammation. Gotcha. Okay. So then we would figure out like what the palisading is happening around. Right. So I don't see a lot of mucin. Um, yeah. And if there, there may be some mucin in here, it's kind of hard to be sure, but you know, when you've got this many histiocytes, it's, it's hard to appreciate, but there is some grayish granular material in here that might be mucin. I mean, I, again, I'm not going to, mucin is not really a diagnostic criterion for, uh, for lupus. So here, there is some mucin over here or GA, but you do see mucin in those two conditions. So that would, would favor uh, more likely a GA or GA like process. Um, so I guess you can see like some collagen bundles. So maybe We just, I don't really know what we're palisading around, what our material is here. Yeah, you know, and there's, there's two things. Um, you can, you always think about what's in the center of the palisade. So that, that's true. That, that's when you get a really good, nice ring, if you will. If you don't get a ring, um, then you kind of have to sort of step back and say, well, wait a minute, you know, there's really no, nothing to really look in the center of the palisade. So let's, let's look at the overall pattern. It looks interstitial. Uh, and also it's got a few areas where the cells are just so predominant, it's forming almost kind of like a, almost a little focal sheet, if you will, of granulomatous inflammation up here. So we still think it's palisaded. Um, there is some mucin. So it might be a variant of GA. So that's, that's one option. Uh, but you think about the other palisaded granulomatous dermatitides, is it necrobiosis lipoidica? No, because I don't think that there's like a lot of degeneration good. There's no collagen degeneration. There's no sclerosis. And it's also doesn't have that layered morphology that goes from side to side and top to bottom. I mean, you biopsy into the a plaque of NLD. Um, it's pretty diffuse, not just focal like this. And it also gives you lymphocytes and plasma cells in addition to the degenerated collagen and the, the histiocytes. So, so it's not that. So if it's, it looks more closest to GA, but it's not classic GA, and then we look carefully, and there's actually some other inflammatory cells in here besides histiocytes. There's some neutrophils here, if you can see that. So it's kind of got an admixed infiltrate of neutrophils and histiocytes, and it's got this palisaded interstitial pattern. So interstitial is, is really a subset of palisaded granulomatous dermatitis. So this is more of a third year question. But what disease looks like GA, often clinically, histologically, it can look like GA, but not exactly like GA. And it has some polys in the infiltrate, as well as the histiocytes that are splayed between and among collagen bundles. I don't know if anybody's put anything in the chat room or not, but that... It's PNGD? Yes, yes. And tell the first years what that stands for. <laughs> I should probably know this. Palisaded neutrophilic granulomatous dermatitis or interstitial granulomatous dermatitis associated with a connective tissue disease. 
and we used to think this was associated with uh, rheumatoid arthritis most of the time, and, but now we know it can be seen in lupus. Uh, a lot of connective tissue diseases can give you this pattern, and it looks a lot like GA, but it looks a little bit different than GA, like you see here. So this, this wouldn't just slant you know, and scream GA to you. And it's also got neutrophils in the infiltrate. And we know that you get neutrophils in things like um, uh, rheumatoid neutrophilic dermatosis, uh, this new rheumatoid, this new neutrophilic inflammatory reaction associated with uh, lupus that you can see neutrophils there, kind of a sweets like inflammatory reaction. Uh, there's also Stills disease. So you get, you get neutrophils also in a lot of connective tissue diseases and the inflammatory dermatoses the, that, you know, things like uh, Stills and, and familiar Mediterranean fever and that sort of thing. And occasionally you'll get that plus this neutrophilic infiltrate. And these can look like sort of these bruise-like uh, plaques. Uh, you know, this may be somehow related indirectly to uh, uh, urticarial vasculitis. It's in that same sort of category of non-specific lupus-like skin conditions, but they're associated with lupus, associated with connective tissue diseases. So you have to, this isn't, you, know, you wouldn't make a diagnosis of lupus on this or rheumatoid arthritis based on this, but you could say that somebody's got this pattern, they might have a connective tissue disease, but this is what it looks like. And uh, if you look at it clinically, it can also even give you a, a linear rope-like lesion in the skin sometimes. So anyway, it's a nice example of that. And uh, you often will sometimes get some degenerated collagen in the center of some of these areas. Um, I think there is some mucin in here. There's not a, you know, a lake of mucin, but there is some mucin here between the, the collagen metals that you can see with H&E here. So this is a nice example of, of that entity. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, let's take a look at this one. Yeah, hey, it looks like a punch, um, trunk extremities. And I was thinking uh, like superficial inflammation with, uh, I was thinking like interface and lichenoid. Was what good, I was. excellent, good, very good. And uh, what kind of cells at this power? Um, I think just maybe lymphocytes and maybe a few histiocytes. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Mostly lymphocytes in here. Uh, we go up here, there might even be, there's definitely some of these cells may be a little bit different. They're a little bit less uh, darkly stained at low power. So there may be even some polys up here. We'll look mm -hmm. at them. And then uh, you're right with regard to the pattern. It's obscuring the interface focally. Um, there are some extravasated erythrocytes mostly lymphocytes, some histiocytes, and there also may be some polys in here. And then a cornified layer has kind of got a compact hyperkeratosis area over here. And we might even see a little bit of parakeratosis. Usually this disease has got more of that than seen here. So what was your uh, differential diagnosis based on this? Um, I wasn't totally sure. I was kind of thinking, I was even thinking on the vac like vacuolar side of things, even though I kind of right. thought like, reverse vacuolar uh like which there is some of that i agree with you yeah. there is some vacuolar alteration here um like em uh gbhd pleva um there's some thoughts about maybe like mf but i thought there's maybe too much spongiosis i didn't think it was epidermotropism for MF. yeah well there's there is a little bit of epidermotropism here but it's kind of focal and it's also associated with some scattered dyskeratotic keratinocytes. It's got okay. some extravasated erythrocytes. Um, it's probably kind of a relatively early lesion because it doesn't have a lot of cornified layer change. This disease usually by the time it's biopsy, it's got a very thick kind of crusted scale to it, okay. which you don't see here. But this is a nice example of pitteriasis lichenoides, uh, kind of in an early stage. And notice that uh, what, what cell was not present here? Uh, I don't think we saw any plasma cells. Yeah, plasma cells would be a good thing to look for because syphilis could definitely give you this pattern as well. I, I remember um, distinctly like, as a resident, a case yeah. that was misdiagnosed for years as plebe, and it turned out to be syphilis. Okay. 
Yeah, eosinophils. Eos, yeah. You never, that's one of the few things in dermatophology that's pretty close to a truism is that you don't get eosinophils in the pitorizes lichenoides group of diseases. Okay. So uh, that's, if you, if you see this pattern and you don't see eosinophils, um, think of pitorizes lichenoides. And uh, the, the various things that we mentioned, the fact that there are the scattered discaritotic keratinocytes, the red cells, those are helpful. So if you see this band-like infiltrate with involving the epidermis, uh, and then you see those other features, that's really helpful for pitorizes lichenoides. Now, uh, the one thing about pitorizes lichenoides, there's, there's several different forms. Um, you can get lesions of pitorizes, patients have pitorizes lichenoides for 20 years, and they can develop acute lesions that have a superficial deep wedge-shaped infiltrate that looks like classic Mucha Haberman disease. And then you see people that have a uh, disease that develops, you know, over the course of weeks, and you biopsy it and it looks more like this. It's kind of looks more like a pitorizes lichenoides chronica pattern. So uh, again, I don't like using the, the names, uh, the chronology of the disease to sort of name it because, you know, you can get acute lesions in people that have chronic conditions that last for years. So I just like to call it pitorizes lichenoides, not really uh, be otherwise specific because I don't really know if it's acute or chronic. The, the classic mucohybrin form, though, does give you a superficial and deep wedge-shaped infiltrate uh, that also gives you more epidermal involvement, can give you epidermal necrosis with ballooning degeneration and some of those things, which we don't see here. So this will be more of kind of the, you think the subacute or maybe the chronic form of the disease just based on this kind of pattern. But the patient may have had it for you know, who knows? This looks like a relatively acute lesion to me because it doesn't have a lot of parakeratosis in it. Uh, you mentioned erythema multiforme. Usually, if you get this much interface change in erythema multiforme, you get more dyskeratotic keratinocytes. So um, I would expect, you know, maybe some of the epidermis to be full thickness necrosis, or at least maybe the bottom half of the epidermis to be necrotic. So uh, generally, with pitorizes lichenoides, you get scattered individually necrotic keratinocytes. And usually with the EM, you don't get all these extravasated red cells. So that would favor pitorizes lichenoides more than, uh, than EM. Uh, this disease can simulate MF, but as you rightly mentioned, it does have a little bit more focal areas of spongiosis. You usually don't get dyskeratotic keratinocytes or extravasated red cells, which are signs of acuteness uh, that you don't see with chronic conditions like mycosis fungoides. So that would militate against, against that. But that's that's good. So you, your differential was was spot on here. Okay, shift gears a little bit here. Okay, I can take this one. Um, so it looks like we're looking at an excision, and then from high power, I see these kind of blue nodules in the dermis. Okay, good. So you think it's an inflammatory or a neoplastic process? I think a neoplastic process. Good. And uh, do you think it's benign or malignant based on this? Um, based off of what I'm seeing, it looks fairly regular. So I would say lean on benign. Okay. When you say regular, um, let's unpack that a little bit. Uh, why is this regular to you? Well, when I see this, I would think like the blue nodules, maybe you could also think about BCC, but I don't see as much like clefting um, that I would think about with BCC. Yeah, we're going to look at that when we go to a higher magnification, but let's stay at this, at this low power. And mm -hmm. so what criteria do you use at low power to favor a benign process? You, you said regular and you're right, it is regular, but we want to like be more um, precise in our terminology as dramatopathologists as to what makes it regular. So we, we say regular, what's your definition? What are the three elements of quote regular at low magnification? It's well circumscribed. Good, good. It's, it's well circumscribed. You can draw a line right around it. What else do you, is good for regular? Fairly symmetric. Good, good. So you draw like a line down the middle of it. Just you can po paste one side pretty much on the other side and it looks the same. What's the last thing that, you, that favors? Um, like well demarcated and not, it's not going super deep. Yeah, that kind of goes along with well, well, with symmetrical and well circumscribed, but also relatively small, relatively small. I mean, this, this clinically probably was a little bump in the skin, right? Mm -hmm. So that favors benign. Now you can get small malignancies. You know, you can get real small Merkel cells I and mean, you get small things too. So every one of these criteria, there's an exception to the rule, you know, so but these are, these are the general criteria that we use 
um, to help us. And so we start off at low magnification. We say that that's probably going to be benign. Okay, so we're going to higher magnification. Then we also ask ourselves at low magnification, we think it's like going to be epithelial or non epithelial. I would say epithelial. Epithelial, yeah. good. And there's quite a few different types of epithelium, too, right? Mm -hmm. So, what subtype of epithelium do you think this probably is exhibiting? Um, like, as far as like a basaloid? Probably. Yeah, it's basaloid. Basaloid. So, say basaloid. Okay, well, what? What's, uh, what are some subtypes of basaloid? So what's, what are the two main uh, types of differentiation that we see that are epithelial, that are basaloid in, in the skin? Um, Where does like, basaloid mostly come from? Like follicular? Yeah, good, from follicles, hair follicles. They also get basaloid non-follicular, like eccrine and apocrine, those look, you know, the cells are, they look basaloid, they look basophilic. So again, we, we sometimes use that. When we think of basaloid, we usually think of like basal cell carcinoma and follicular differentiation, but you can get the basophilic morphology with non-follicular as well. And obviously neuroendocrine, sometimes melanocytic and other things like that can give you kind of a basophilic basaloid morphology. But most of the time we mean follicle. And we think about the follicle, which part of the follicle is giving rise to this basaloid differentiation here. Um, here, like, it's, I don't think it's infundibular. No, good. Here's infundibulum over here, right? Mm -hmm. It's a little infundibulum. That looks more like squamous epithelium. So the, the top part looks squamous. Then you get the infant, then you get the isthmus, which is, can, can give you this, the, the, the little, uh, you know, mantle zone can give you basaloid differentiation. And then the inferior portion is kind of where we think of it, right? I mean, those are where the stem cells are. They're forming the hair shaft down there. You got the papilla. So again, that, that's giving you the inferior portion of the follicle. So that's what, what is giving you most of this that we're looking at. Okay, good. So we think probably benign, or if it's malignant, like a basal cell carcinoma, it's gonna be pretty low, low grade malignancy. We're not thinking of this being like a anaplastic squamous cell carcinoma or something like that. So again, if it's if it's gonna be malignant, it's gonna be so low grade that we're, you know, it's not gonna metastasize. Okay, so good. So we think it's, it's epithelial, we think it's basaloid, um, we think it's probably benign. And then, so now uh, we go to higher magnification. And you said something earlier about there really weren't very many clefts between the stroma and the uh, and the epithelium, which favors a benign non-basal basal carcinoma, right? Because basal carcinoma usually gives you that cleft. What about the stroma itself? Is this the type of stroma that you see with the basal cell carcinoma? Um, no, not typically. I feel like you. It's more cellular here. Way more cellular. Yeah, this has a lot of fibroblast. It's got this eosinophilic collagen. Basal cell carcinoma generally tends to give you a fibromucinous stroma. So it looks different than what we see with, uh, with classic um, basal cell carcinoma. So that, that favors more of a benign adnexal neoplasm. So, so benign, follicular, inferior portion of the follicle or probably possibly the mantle zone of the follicle. Um, and maybe we've got some little primitive uh, papillary mesenchymal bodies kind of going on here. What is your diagnosis? Um, I would say trico F probably. Yeah, it looks, it looks like a possibly a variant of trichothelium, but what's a little bit, it kind of gets more into third year a little bit now. Um, is this really a classic trichoepithelioma? Does it look a little bit more primitive than a trichoepithelioma? Are these really making really good papillary mesenchymal bodies? Are there any cysts with calcification in the, the, in the lesion? No, Not so really. it's trichoblastoma. Yeah, trichoblastoma. So again, and there are several different variants of trichoblastoma, and, and you don't really need to delve deeply into those for the board, okay? So the good news is you don't really need to, to do that. There, but there's one subtype of, of a uh, trichoblastoma that looks a lot like a trichoep, if you will, it's like a giant 
large variant of trichothelioma. There, there are other types that even look more primitive than this. There's a kind of a rippled pattern trichoblastoma. So there's several different forms of those. You don't need to know all those. I would just say if you if you got this into the category of benign follicular, you said it was trichoep, or you look down and and the it was a multiple choice question and it had uh, trichoblastoma, that would be your answer here. So this is basically you're right, benign follicular inferior portion of the follicle. Um, it's in the category of of follicle tumors. That's if you said trichoep, you're okay. If you said trichoblastoma, you get a gold star. So that's basically an example of, of a trichoblastoma here. And one other thing I'll mention about these, if you start looking at these, you're going to see mitotic figures here. Okay, right? This is a one of the most rapidly proliferating epithelia in our body. Bone marrow, rapidly proliferating structure. Uh, you get chemotherapy for cancer and your hair falls out because your follicle epithelium is proliferating so rapidly, it kills that too. So you're going to see mitotic figures in these primitive follicular tumors. That doesn't mean that it's a malignancy. So again, we never use one criterion to make the diagnosis of benign or malignant. We always use a constellation of criteria. And so you, you wouldn't wanna zoom in on something like this, and say, oh my God, they're mitoses, therefore it's cancer. So uh, we, we wanna use everything and, and start off at low power and use all of our architectural and our cytologic criteria to, to make a diagnosis. So this one is a punch biopsy. It looks inflammatory um, with a, I think, lymphocytic, superficial and deep perivascular infiltrate, and then also some periecrine inflammation down lower. Good, good, um, excellent. And it's pretty, uh, it's pretty much around vessels and adnexal structures. So as opposed to the to the interstitial granulomas dermatitis case we saw before that was both perivascular and interstitial, and as opposed to the case of pterygoid lichenoides that we saw was more of a band-like infiltrate up here, now we've got involvement around these blood vessels and even involving some of the adnexal structures. What part of the body are we on here? Um, it's pretty thick dermis. So yes. Trunk? Probably trunk or, or proximal extremity. Good. Mm -hmm. I agree with you on that. Why is that potentially important here? Hmm. That's sort of a difficult question, but yeah, well, but it is, but in this case, the location in the body is helpful. So what if yeah. we said so this I was on volar skin? Yeah. What? So then I would think it might be a perniosis. Good. Just good, good. A, yeah. Edema. Yeah. So if you if you if you took this and cut and pasted it on somebody's, you know, uh, foot or, you know, maybe they're in an ICU and it's on their hand and they had COVID. Um, yeah. You might say, wow, this looks like pernia. Right. But it's not on those parts of the body. So that throws us into a different category, wow. most likely. So with the there's a lot of papillary dermal edema. So I think my first thought was a PMLE. But Good. A lot of so if I, it gets great. So yeah. the way that you know that you've learned dermatopathology, if someone can describe it to you at three o'clock in the morning and <laughs> you then can come up with that answer that quickly, it means you know what it ought to look like. You know the pattern. So that's good. <laughs> so you're exactly right. Superficial and deep lymphocytic infiltrate with papillary dermal edema. The first thing you should think about is polymorphous light eruption. So that's the number one thing that you should think about. If somebody says, well, it's on, it's on the skin, on the toe or the hand, so well, you know, pernio can also give you that pattern. Um, the periadnexal involvement, don't let that throw you off. Okay. I mean, we, you know, that, that's, that, you know, sometimes there's some extraneous information because the textbooks, they don't talk about that. They just, they cut it off here. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, don't, they don't talk about the fact that it can also give you periadnexal involvement okay. as well. I mean, that doesn't mean that it's not polymorphous light eruption. Um, and, and I, you know, again, if I saw this on volar skin with that periadnexal involvement, I would probably favor pernio. Mm -hmm. But the fact that this is not on that location, it's probably going to be more likely a photodermatitis like polymorphous mm -hmm. light eruption. And so that shows you the value of being able to recognize the anatomic location for diagnosis. 
So the pattern, I mean, this, this could be, I, you could see this exact same pattern in Pernio, if this were just in another location. So those are the, the, the two things here that really we should focus on primarily. So there's not a lot else that we really would think about on this line. Now, what if we're looking down at, at our multiple choice questions and our choices, and they have uh, some other things in here, like they say, well, photo uh, uh, induced drug eruption. And then they have uh, chronic actinic dermatitis. Are you going to choose either one of those when you've got this pattern here? What if they have, uh, you know, juvenile uh, springtime eruption, Hydro Esta Valley? Are you going to choose that here? Are you going to let those, those things talk you out of your uh, diagnosis? Oh, I think I should stand my ground. You should stand your ground. Why, why should you? And that's the that's the important point because these guys are smart when they write these questions and they say well let's let's think how we can trip them up here right. so let's put uh hydroesta valley in here why is it not that well the juvenile spring eruption is that normally on the ear yeah but it doesn't have to be on the ear it can be on the trunk <laughs> and the extremities too um I don't know if that one would also have such profound edema. No, it doesn't. What does it usually have? Ooh, I'm not sure. Okay, now, but you, you will be after I tell you. <laughs> it gives ballooning degeneration. Okay. So it gives a lot of epidermal involvement. Those those lesions, if you, and you know, it's a relatively uncommon condition, but you know, you you may have seen a case or two. I don't know if you you had yet, but they give you these blisters crusted blisters on the on the ears and face most commonly but also sometimes another you know photo distributed the location but you get uh, you get ballooning degeneration in the epidermis you don't see that here so this is a right. dermal mostly inflammatory reaction and the fact that it might look vesicular is because of the edema so this is this would be a dermal blister if yeah. a blister develops in polymorphous light eruption what about chronic actinic dermatitis Hmm. So it's one thing to know the right answer. It's another thing to make sure you don't get. Yeah. Um, you know why the other <laughs> you don't start talking. second guessing yourself when they put this other thing in there because, gosh, I don't know what that looks like. So, anybody know what that pattern classically looks like? Nobody in the chat. The chat's uh, safe. You know, you can, you're anonymous. Yeah, in the someone chat. says it's more psoriasiform. <laughs> it's a psoriasiform lichenoid pattern that simulates mycosis fungoides a lot. Okay. So it's a very dense psoriasiform lichenoid process, and often it's really got a lot of lichen simplex chronicus. It's a chronic condition. It can really look a lot like MF. The cells can even be atypical um, in that condition, and and those patients are debilitated. They they the action spectrum of of that disease is visible light, extends into the visible light range. So a lot of those people actually have to go into dark rooms. They become literally like vampires. They, they can't go outside during the daytime at all. Even sunscreens don't block that out. So it's really a tragic disease. You don't, you don't want people to have that. Thank goodness it's rare. And then, a, you know, a, a photo drug eruption, you know, again, that gave you a lot of patterns. But that's usually going to give you some epidermal involvement. So the main thing here, yeah, this is a classic, beautiful example of PMLE and, and it does, uh, it would simulate pernio if we were in a different location. So that's good. Thank you. You know, if we don't make it through all these, it's not the end of the world. Um, we can, you know, do these next month and, and I'll send you some more too, but uh, we, we can just take our time, go through these and learn as much as we can here today. So who wants to give this one a go? I can go, um, looks like, a punch, um, and I thought it was a nodular dermatitis. I thought the epidermis was relatively uninvolved. Good, uh, epidermis is spared here. That's an important important point. And there is nodularity to some of the infiltrate, I agree with you, but is it purely nodular? Uh, probably some diffuse in there too. Nodular. Yeah, and, and uh, it's got a little higher magnification. Let's just look at this area right here. What do you call this pattern? Mm. 
Um, diffuse or? Well, they are pigeonous. Notice that it's it's got these these uh, normal collagen bundles. You got these cells that are present kind of between them. So what do we call that when they're sort of uh, incorporating themselves between the collagen bundles in the interstices of the collagen bundles? Interstitial. Interstitial. Good. So it's got some nodularity. I agree with you. I mean, if this were literally a perfect case, it would be mostly interstitial, but you can see it's got a distinctly interstitial pattern. And it's, it's basically what's happened here is that you've got this really diffuse interstitial pattern. And the cells are just so numerous, they've actually formed some nodular aggregations in here. But recognize the interstitial component of that, because that's, that's an important hallmark of this disorder. And the other thing about this is that the good news about interstitial patterns is that there's relatively few items that give you that. So when you're thinking of a differential diagnosis of interstitial mostly, there's really not a lot. So you, so we don't, when you get superficial perivascular dermatitis, there's about a hundred things. So it's, it's, that's difficult to come up with just one quick answer. We come up with interstitial mostly, there's only about seven or eight. Mm -hmm. And so you can easily kind of go through that differential and, and then figure it out pretty quickly. Gotcha. I'm pretty lacking on my interstitial differential. Um, <laughs> well, kinda, we'll, 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 we'll rectify that. <laughs> I was thinking there was a Gren zone, but maybe I could be way off. That's kind of no, no, no. Off. You're you're way on. You're you're absolutely correct. Yeah. There is a Gren zone. This is sparing the papillary dermis and the epidermis, and yeah. there's a reason for that. There's a reason for that. What does that tell you when that's spared? Is the process starting here and going here, if that's fair? No. It's no, 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 it's not. Something internal is moving to the skin when mm -hmm. you get that pattern most of the time. So something is, is going from somewhere else into the skin. So mm -hmm. you can say, okay, uh, what, do we think this is inflammatory or neoplastic? I thought inflammatory. Okay, they're inflammatory cells. Yes. They certainly are. Are these normal inflammatory cells? They didn't, I didn't see like marked atypia. Um, yeah, I thought so, like histiocytes is what I was They thinking. look histiocytic. I agree with you. They look histiocytic. Now, here's a mitotic figure here, and there's pleomorphism. And um, so again, you have to kind of be able to recognize this. But if you didn't think they were uh, abnormal, what, what you think they're histiocytes, so then what's your differential diagnosis of a histiocytic inflammatory reaction with an interstitial pattern? We've kind of already said a little bit of that in the previous yeah. interstitial granulomas dermatitis, right? We kind of worked through that. So did you think this was GA? Uh, that was on there. I was kind of thinking more like sarcoid leprosy. You thought of Hansen's that's disease. That, that's good. That's, yeah. that's not unreasonable yeah. to think that because that does give you a grin zone. Uh, in that. That's basically a secondary reaction that's involving the skin kind of, I mean, the skin does get involved in that too, but it ain't, it's not coming straight from the epidermis. It's getting into nerves. And so it's really mm -hmm. more of a systemic infection that involves the skin secondarily because the skin is cool and the organisms like the skin and it gets into nerves and blood vessels. So it's, it's kind of an analogous process to this. But as we look at higher magnification, um, you've got some, there's a mitotic figure there. There's pleomorphism here. So these cells, they probably are in the monocyte macrophage category. Okay. So if you did a, uh, or is there a foamy cytoplasm to these? There, there's some abundant cytoplasm, but it doesn't really look like there's any globi or anything like that. Another thing you can do if you're thinking about Hansen's is you can look and see if there's any nerve involvement. Um, you know, if it's, uh, you should see, you know, you got some periannexal involvement here, but you know, there, there may be some residual nerves that are sort of preserved here. So what else do you think about interstitial mostly pattern? Mm. This is, you know, it's kind of a, a difficult, sophisticated question, but it's in the differential 
diagnosis and hopefully third years would kind of know about this. We think about metastatic neoplasms too, when they spread to the skin, you know, like metastatic breast, so-called Indian file pattern and neoplastic cells between collagen bundles and these, these small cords and strands. Uh, we obviously think about that. Um, the fact that these are kind of the monocyte macrophage lineage and they are atypical and they're present in this interstitial pattern. Does anybody have any idea what that might indicate? Anybody put anything in the chat room? Well, what if I said we took this person's blood and it was not normal? And you had like a, a high white count of maybe 500,000. Yeah, like uh, lymphoma, maybe cell lymphoma, like a leukemia. Yeah, like a leukemia cutis. So this is a, an example of leukemia involving the skin. And the fact that the cells look like histiocytes, what kind of leukemia do you think it might be? Uh, like monocyte macrophages, like AMML, yeah. like myelomonocytic. So those cells look like histiocytes because they're monocytes, which are in the you know, histiocyte family, if you will. And so they can look a lot like histiocytes when they get in the skin. So this was a person that had AMML, uh, they actually had a, a flare of their condition and developed leukemia acuta. So, so we talk about interstitial, uh, mostly pattern. And that's the, the key to this diagnosis is recognize interstitial mostly the grin zone, the lack of epidermal involvement that you, you recognized. Uh, the key then to the diagnosis is recognizing the cells and seeing that they're atypical. And we've got these cords and strands of cells little small, you know, individual, these are cells just lining up one, two, three, four, five, right there. That's very characteristic of, of this breast cancer and that sort of thing. Um, we talked about interstitial GA can look like this. And then the GA like simulators, the interstitial granulomatous dermatitis, all those entities that can do that. And then metastatic breast cancer, uh, the adnexal neoplasms like the morpheiform basal cell carcinoma can give you that pattern. Uh, uh, microcystic and nexal carcinoma can be interstitial mostly. So there's a relatively limited differential. Uh, plaque stage capuchy sarcoma, interstitial mostly in that situation, patch plaque disease, which is involving the blood vessels diffusely. So the good news is there's a relatively small uh, differential. So make sure you learn that and think about that when you see this pattern the next time. You say, well, gosh, this looks like that's something may have spread to the skin secondarily. It's kind of the splay pattern. I'm going to think about leukemia. Uh, involving the skin secondarily or metastatic carcinoma. Okay, so we have enough time to do a couple more. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me, okay, good. So this looks like in either a very large punch or an excision, um, we do still see some epidermis. From this power, I would say it's a, um, Neoplastic process, probably malignant. I don't see any circumscript, circum it's like extending, it's not well circumscribed. Exactly. You know, this thing they, is a giant process that they took an incision or a punch into. Goes, so, this is a good example of, of, in contrast to that trichoblastoma we saw a minute ago, this is absolutely poorly circumscribed. It's very diffuse, top to bottom, side to side. It's obviously they just took a sample of some something much larger. And also notice how diffuse it is. I mean, this is involving everything. This is replacing all that nexal structures, dermis is replaced, this, this is not good. So you see something like this at low power, you go, uh-oh. <laughs> so malignant. Now, can we tell whether it's epithelial or non-epithelial at this power? Not definitively. It's pretty purple. So I would favor kind of an epithelial process. Yeah. Yeah. Good. I agree with you. It's certainly if it's not epithelial, it's epithelioid. It looks like it's forming, you know, it's solid. Um, the cells are going to be closely opposed to one another as you get to higher magnification. So yeah, it, it, it looks like a malignant, either epithelial neoplasm or something that's, that's simulating an epithelium. So, so mm -hmm. we're, we're like 90% done, right? At this point, once you've recognized that at low magnification, 
Um, then you zoom into higher magnification. Well, let's see if there's any other defining features that we can make a definitive diagnosis with a higher magnification. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. When they're poorly differentiated, um, you may not be able to do that. You may have to, to do special stains to do that. We like to try to do it with routine morphology. And uh, what do you see at this power? There's definitely a lot of red cells, some of them extravasated in these like Good. slit like open spaces, almost yeah. to form vessels, it looks like. Yeah, now some of that might be artifact. We see that's mm -hmm. well, kind of clefty, you know, is that really true? But then we look at some areas like this, and there's actually some lining of some of these spaces here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and with that's, rather that's a very atypical. atypical hyperchromatic nucleus right there that's lining these vascular spaces. Here's another one over here. So what's the diagnosis? I'm favoring like an epithelial angiosarcoma. You're about 99.9% .9 correct. What, what's the one thing that you said that was not- Oh, epithelioid, not- Good, epithelial. good, good. Good, epithelioid angiosarcoma. Excellent, that's exactly what this is. So this is an angiosarcoma and it's educational because when you look at an area like this, um, <laughs> we, this is a good example of talking about epithelioid. That looks like squamous cell carcinoma in many ways. I mean, these cells are very closely opposed to one another. Um, you know, are there desmosomes here? I mean, I'm not sure. You, know, you can't say, but uh, it really looks like an epithelium. And so we talk about epithelioid. That's what we mean, that it's simulating an epithelium. Now, here's a little bit of a residual, probably a nexal structure. That, that is really and truly epithelium here. And this is not epithelium. So, but it looks pretty similar. You know, it looks like it's trying to form an epithelium. So this is one of the variants of angiosarcoma. There's about five or six different subtypes. Here's a nice example here of more of the well-differentiated epithelial, uh, ep I'm sorry, just, of, of, of just angiosarcoma. So this is not the epithelioid variant here. This is a well-differentiated low-grade angiosarcoma here. If you just had a, a small biopsy of, of this, <laughs> you know, it'd be much more difficult to diagnose this. This has more of the staghorn morphology, the classic form that we see. And then this one's even got some of these freely floating uh, atypical endothelial cells in the lumen, which we see, I mean, this is really a good clue to the diagnosis when you see this, but you can see how this is morphing uh, sort of almost imperceptibly into the epithelioid angiosarcoma over here. So this area, you'd have uh, no problem diagnosing this as a malignancy, but you might not be able to tell for sure what it is. This area, you might have trouble if this is all you had, uh, being certain that you're even dealing with a malignancy here. I mean, so you, that's one of the reasons why when you're dealing with a, a lesion like an angiosarcoma, you really need to get a, a, a large biopsy. Don't be scrimpy in the diagnosis uh, uh, when you're dealing with something that might be angiosarcoma. I, we get you know, shave biopsies, believe it or not, of rule out angiosarcoma. And that's a, it's, it's a dangerous situation. Whenever dermatologists and the soft tissue neoplasms um, encounter one another, it's usually like a train wreck. There's usually often, there's a problem. Uh, either the diagnosis gets delayed, they don't take a deep enough biopsy, um, maybe it gets called like a squamous cell when it's really a you know, epithelioid sarcoma or something like that, or epithelioid angiosarcoma like this. Um, I've seen cases of Mohs surgeons start doing Mohs on angiosarcomas because they get a superficial biopsy. It gets called a squamous cell. They think they're dealing with, with squamous cell and lo and behold, they're dealing with something a lot more aggressive and they, they can't clear it. So just make sure whenever you're dealing with something like this, don't take a shave, don't take a punch, take a, a large biopsy, knife and fork biopsy. Because uh, you don't want to get in a situation where you get an erroneous diagnosis and the diagnosis gets delayed. And I've seen the diagnosis get delayed of angiosarcoma, and then it ends up in a, in a medical legal situation. So um, you don't want that to happen uh, to you. So uh, why don't we end up maybe with this one? Uh, Sounds good. So this one is a shave biopsy. Um, okay. And one of the other cuts I thought was more inflammatory, but this area. Yeah, this, this is a uh, interesting situation here where I think the, the clinician was worried about cancer um, because 
something had been done here before. So it doesn't look neoplastic, does it? No, it doesn't. I mean, there's a little bit of epithelial hyperplasia. So there's something going on in the dermis. Uh, there's a little bit of inflammation. And it would have been nice if they did a punch here, but they, they really were thinking this might have been a recurrent cancer. So they took a shave biopsy of this lesion. And uh, it's hard to tell what part of the body it's on, but it may be like somewhere in the head and neck area, it might be near the ear, for example. And if it's inflammatory, which of the nine patterns are we dealing with here? Maybe like a diffuse. There's not really much inflammation, is there? Sparse inflammation. Sparse. But what's the main pathologic abnormality? We see a lot of like almost degeneration. There's a lot of solar elastosis. Yeah, there's solar elastosis. What's this reaction pattern we're looking at here? Is this normal collagen here? No. No, it's not. This is fibrin up here, that's, but forget that. But let's focus on this area right in here. So what do you call this collagen that's homogenized, that's got a, that absence of fibroblasts within these areas right here? What do you call that pattern? You get a, a homogenization of the collagen bundles with a loss of fibroblasts. What's that histologic reaction pattern known as? I am blanking on the name. Sclerosis is in the chat. Sclerosis, good. Mm -hmm. Sclerosis. So you can get you can get sclerotic papillary dermis, you get scler sclerotic reticular dermis, right? And this is down in the reticular dermis here. So these are thick sclerotic collagen bundles. And what about this cell right here? Does that look like a normal looking cell to you? No. No. What's wrong with that thing? It's pretty large and atypical. It reminds yeah, it's me of large like and kind of bizarre in its morphology. Mm -hmm. And there's several of those over here. Yeah. That's really bizarre. <laughs> it's kind of a good way to, to think of that. It's, it's pleomorphic. It's probably not malignant, but it's, it's pleomorphic. So you get sclerotic collagen bundles with pleomorphic fibroblasts in them. What do you think about? Radiation dermatitis. Yeah, chronic radiodermatitis, chronic radiation dermatitis. And this was an individual. Here's another area over here, maybe better over here, actually. Um, that had undergone radiation therapy for a basal cell in this area. And they were, it kind of got sclerotic and crusted and red and some telangiectasia. It was probably just some, they kind of said, well, you know, this, this might be recurrent basal cells. So they took a shave. And the good news is it's not recurrent basal cell, but they had chronic radiation dermatitis that had kind of broken down a little bit and, and, you know, got this red crusted stuff up here. And they said, well, gosh, this might be recurrent cancer. Well, it wasn't. It was just chronic radiation dermatitis. So this, if they show you this on the board examination, they're probably going to give you like a deeper punch biopsy. That's maybe from somebody that had breast cancer or something like that, that got chronic radiation. But this is what you see. So when you see sclerotic dermal collagen, we think about things like morphia, scleroderma, all those different diseases are in the same pattern. We see sclerotic collagen in, in necrobiosis like poetica. Um, we see an LSNA. We see it when you get combination of LSNA and, and morphia together. So those are the situations where you see dermal sclerosis. When you see dermal sclerosis plus these bizarre fibroblasts, they're not cancerous. They're just, you know, unusual, bizarre fibroblasts because of the chronic radiation you should think of chronic radiodermatitis. Um, you can sometimes see sclerotic collagen uh, in lupus. You can also see it in, in uh, uh, chondrodermatitis. So those are just some other areas where you can see sclerotic collagen metals, but you don't see the, uh, the bizarre fibroblasts associated with it. So that's chronic radiodermatitis. Okay. Why don't we stop today?